Now, The Hunt Palmer Show. Yes! I feel like I've been waiting for this my entire life. You're listening to The Hunt Palmer Show on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. Jolly good fun. Jolly, jolly good. Locking down the middle of the day. America's favorite daytime fun show. Live from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge studio. This is Hunt Palmer. Number two, Wednesday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show. Half the work week officially in the rearview mirror. Thanks for hanging out with us here on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. SEC football power rankings coming at you in 30 minutes. Quick score update from Houston in the wild card round of the playoffs. Nothing, nothing between the Tigers and the Astros. It's the bottom of the second inning. Of course, Detroit won that game behind the eventual Cy Young winner yesterday. So the Astros trying to keep their season alive in the juice box and probably to keep Alex Bregman's Astros career alive. Very, very likely he goes into free agent and signs elsewhere this coming off season. So keep you posted on that uh, as we move forward. Bregman incidentally is on uh, first base. He got on as uh, the leadoff man here in the bottom of the second inning for the Houston Astros. All right, let's talk some Saints. As you're all very well aware, uh, there's been some reporting in the last 24 hours that Devontae Adams is looking to get out, and the two places he would like to go would be the New York Jets, where Aaron Rodgers, his former quarterback, plays, and the New Orleans Saints, where Derek Carr, his former quarterback in two different stops at Fresno State and Las Vegas, plays quarterback. And so the question is, does this make any sense for New Orleans to go get Devontae Adams? Well, let's look at Devontae Adams right now. He's 32 years old. He has been an elite-level receiver in the league for 11 seasons. I'm talking about a guy that went over 1,000 yards in 2018, 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023. He led the NFL in touchdowns in 2020 with 18. He led the NFL in touchdowns again in 2022 with Derek Carr with 14 for the Raiders as a 30-year-old. The last year, he played in every game. The year before that, he played in every game. The year before that, he played in every game. He's been very durable. He's been very productive. He was a first-team All-Pro in 2020, 2021, and 2022. Wasn't last year, but he's still a really, really good player. And the New Orleans Saints are not very good at wide receiver, and they're certainly not deep at wide receiver. Chris Olave is a nice number one option. I think he is a number one option. Is he a dominant player in the NFL? I wouldn't go that far. Rashid Shaheed does some things really, really well, namely run fast. But is he the best number two in football? I I don't think so. And then beyond that, it's a bucket of yuck. So you could make room for Devontae Adams on this team, sure, in terms of catching footballs. I'm sure he and Derek Carr could could hit it off pretty quickly, and you'd be more productive in the passing game with Devontae Adams as as opposed to Cedric Wilson as opposed to Bub Means, who was out there, as opposed, as opposed to Mason Tipton. Yeah, you'd, you'd be better. So should they go make that happen? Well, then you start talking about numbers. And I'm certainly not going to get into dollars and cents to the nickel here. But we'll speak in generalities. Devontae Adams this year has a base salary of almost $17 million. Now, he's played four games, so you would prorate that, and you're looking at about $13 million and change remaining on his contract, and the Saints have about $3 million in cap space. So you'd have to get creative there. There are players you can get creative with. Alvin Kamara is one of them. If you want to restructure his contract, you can clear cap space, and then you would restructure Devontae Adams' contract to get things where they need to be under the salary cap. You're looking at a hit north of $20 million on Devontae Adams' contract next year, and he's under contract through 2026. So what does this mean in general terms? You would do the same freaking thing you've been doing and doing and doing and doing that we have praised you on this show for not doing since January. Signing old players for lots of money and taking the money and spreading it out over years and ending up with dead money here and guys that aren't on your roster that you're paying for there and expensive players that are past their prime all over the place, and the Saints have to stop doing that. It's enticing to bring in the name Devontae Adams. But to do that, 
one of the likely paths is paying exorbitant amounts of money for 30-plus-year-old Devontae Adams and Alvin Kamara past their prime. And I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about the life of the contract where the money sits. And that's got to stop. And you don't immediately... The the Saints changed course this this offseason. They stuck to one-year deals. They didn't massively restructure things. They didn't take on a ton of debt and look to kick cans down roads. They did not do that this offseason. And just because you dusted the Cowboys doesn't mean you uproot everything and panic and go all in this way. No, you don't do it. It would be super fun to watch the Sports Center crawl go across and go, the Saints have agreed to terms with the Raiders for Devontae Adams. And it would be really fun when he showed up in New Orleans for that first game in the black and gold, and he would catch a touchdown. It would be incredible. Oh, this is so much fun. And then you realize that the other part of that scroll across the ticker said that you gave up a second-round pick and that you're restructuring Alvin Kamara's contract and you're restructuring Devontae Adams' contract and you're paying 33-year-olds exorbitant amounts of money and they may or may not be on the team and it might be dead money or it might just be past your prime money and you're back in the same situation you're always in. I think it would be an advantage to the New Orleans Saints in terms of roster construction to get closer to the middle of the league in terms of cap space instead of being freaking last or second to last or third to last at all times. I want you to spend the money on the salary cap, but I want you to have some flexibility to go help your roster out. And that doesn't happen because you take a bunch of your salary cap money and dump it into 32-year-olds instead of using your draft picks to get cheap players that can help you for multiple years and don't crush you when it comes to cap season. I know it'd be fun to see Devontae Adams in black and gold because he's been one of the best receivers in football for a decade. But that's the point. He's been playing football in the NFL for a decade. And the thing that I always talk about when we discuss free agent and trade acquisitions in pro sports is you're, you the best way to do this is to pay guys for what they're currently doing, not for what they once did. How many times over the last two weeks have I sung the praises of Alvin Kamara? Twice a week. I am so impressed with his professionalism and toughness. I'm so impressed with what he's been able to do all banged up in this offense to be the heart and soul of what they're doing right now. That doesn't mean I need him doing it two years from now. And it doesn't mean that because four years ago he was one of the best running backs in the league and right now he's toughing it out through broken ribs and almost beating the Falcons that I need to be paying him two years from now. Those first two weeks were really fun and I was certainly singing a different tune after week two than I was before week one and honestly than I am right now. If you were 4-0 and you had beaten all four of these teams, 48-17, to and it looked exactly like it did week one, week two, week three, week four, and you did the same thing to Atlanta and to Philly and to Dallas that you did to Carolina, I, I, might, cha- I might change my tune. But the fact of the matter is you didn't, and you've lost two games, and your offensive line's banged up, and I'm just not willing to go nuts here based on two weeks of football. Again, I'm not completely changing my narrative from the beginning of the season. Kind of changing it from two weeks ago, but we had different information. This would be a mistake to give away multiple draft picks or to restructure multiple aging contracts for big sums of money in a panic move because you've got some guys hurt. And the Saints have stuck to their guns this offseason. And nothing's happened yet, so I'm not ready to fly off the handle at New Orleans. But I think this would be a bad idea. Just my two cents. If you've got yours, we'd love to see them in the Bayou Ford chat. Love to see them also on YouTube there, Hunt on Saints, where all of our Saints content does live. Schefter reporting, Devontae Adams kind of looking around. Earlier today, uh, Antonio Pierce, the Raiders head coach, met with uh, reporters, said Adams is dealing with a hamstring. The rest of the guys are getting ready for their game coming up this weekend. We'll see what happens. He wants out. He wants a trade. He wants to go to his old quarterbacks. Send him to New York. I think that's fine if you're the Saints. Don't give away multiple draft picks. Don't give away 
your flexibility that you're trying to work towards. You got to get back to a reset here. We'll see if that's what, in fact, they decide to do. The SEC football power rankings are coming up in 20 minutes. Don't go anywhere. It's a Wednesday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show. The Hunt Palmer Show. Highland Insurance Group. HighlandIG.com is the website. When was the last time you gave your insurance broker a Google review? Doesn't happen a lot. It's not something people think to do very often. But the customer service is so great. And the insurance experience is so great with the folks at Highland Insurance Group that folks do that over a hundred times. They've been reviewed on Google. They've got a phenomenal rating. Go check it out. Give them a call. If you're a business owner, this is a call you need to make. Because I, in my experience in insurance for seven years, there were quite a few business owners that had a vague understanding of what the insurance program did. But I got a lot of questions like, hey, what does this do? What does this cover? Are we good there? And if, if you don't know, you need to have someone on your team that does. And the Highland Insurance Group does. They will make sure you're protected in the event of a crisis. And that's the point of insurance. I know we like to think about insurance on the front end. Where can we save money here? How do we move things around there? Can we manipulate this to save 10% here or there? It's really hurting the bottom line. And that's one way to go about things. And it's important to consider the price, but you've got to consider the product as well. And the Howard Insurance Group represents tons and tons of markets, tons and tons of lines of insurance that can make sure that your business is protected. So check them out at highlandig.com. If you're looking for group employee benefits, they can help you with that as well. It's your one-stop shop for all things insurance right here in Baton Rouge, but honestly, anywhere in the state of Louisiana, they can help you out. It's the Highland Insurance Group, highlandig.com. This is the Hunt Palmer Show. Hopefully Hunt remembered to bring his laptop charger. Nah, there's no chance. I think we're good on the laptop charger front. Oh, yeah? Looking at, I uh, got one hour and 43 minutes. That's 57% remaining, and we only got 50 minutes, 40 minutes of show left. That's not bad. So, you know, Impressive. We, we've got we've got an hour of, of buffer there. Even if Matt, you know, needs me to do the first hour of AFR, I'm still good without going up and getting the charger. Very good, huh? But if I need the charger, I can always go get it. Yeah, even though you've never done that before. When you That's not true. It. I've, it's di- well, it's died a couple times, and I, I, didn't, I didn't go get it. Yes, so. precisely. All right, let's speaking of dying, conferences are dying left and right. Pac-12 is trying to kill other conferences. Mountain West is struggling. Pac-12 seeing if they can resurrect things with Gonzaga basketball. It, it's a mess out there, but no one really cares what the Pac-12 does. No one really cares what the Mountain West does either because they're insignificant. Uh, who The significant players here are the Big Ten and the SEC. The rule being he who makes the gold, who, he who has the gold makes the rules. That would be the golden rule. Um, they have all the gold, so they're going to make the rules. And there's already been a partnership, Heather Dennis is reporting this at ESPN, that the athletic directors and presidents and uh, and commissioners have put together. Um, and they're pushing things forward for a new format of college football in terms of crowning a champion and how they want to want to split things up. So the discussion is going to take place at an in-person meeting in Nashville next week. Multiple sources told Heather that. And it's a continuation of the Big Ten and SEC Joint Advisory Group, which got formed back in February. And as I mentioned, includes the presidents, chancellors, athletic directors, Greg Sankey, Tony Petiti. Um, And they're all going to go there for one day and kind of talk about some things. And they're looking to put together a scheduling partnership. But the holdup here is the amount of conference games. The Big Ten is going to play nine. And the Big Ten is not going to get into a situation where we're subjectively picking playoff teams, which we are right now. It's subjective. You get into a room with the committee, and they come up with the 12 teams. You've got objectively the four power conferences and the group of five team, but everybody after that is subjectively put in. And the Big 12, Big Ten is not going to enter, enter into agreement where their teams are playing nine league games and the SEC is only playing eight whereby your team playing Penn State or Wisconsin is being weighed the same theoretically as an SEC team playing North Texas or Rice. They're not going to do that. And the SEC has not been in a hurry to move to nine league games. I think there are some in the SEC that want to move to nine league games, but they're not going to do it without assurances from their television partners, in this case ESPN, ABC, the whole Disney Corp., that they're going to get more money for playing more games. And until they get that, they don't have the incentive to move. 
the quote that Henner has in here from her source says, if we're all going to figure this out, we've got to be on equal footing. That means, hey, SEC, we're at nine games. You need to get to nine games. And that will eventually happen. That, that will eventually happen. And so both leagues would prefer to have four automatic bids to the playoff when that new contract begins in 2026. That means eight total teams from those two leagues making the playoffs. Does this sound familiar? Not that long ago, four teams from each NFL conference got into the playoffs. Now, they expanded just like the NCAA is going, well, not the NCAA, the college football playoff is going to do here. I'm careful with that. The NCAA crowns the basketball champion. They don't crown the football champion. But they're they're moving this closer and closer to the NFL model. We're taking away North Texas. We're taking away Florida Atlantic. We're taking away Toledo. We're going to take one of those away, and we're going to put that together with an SEC game. That gets closer. Then all of a sudden, we put a partnership together with the Big Ten, so we're playing one of them every year. That's kind of like the AFC-NFC. And now we're going to dominate the numbers in the playoff selection, each getting four teams in. Now, as Dennis writes, the there's going to be pushback from this proposal by the other leagues. The little guy wants those games because they want the check, and those in the ACC and Big 12 are going to say, hey, well, there's 12 teams and you're taking eight of the spots? I don't think so. So that pushback will exist. But in my opinion, the money's going to win out here. And the SEC and the Big Ten are going to look at it and say, we don't care what you say. We run this. And whether or not that means they open up their doors and fully come together and take those Big 12 teams and take those ACC teams and form together to actually make one league, or they just take over that portion of the CFP. That remains to be seen, and I don't know enough to tell you what direction things are going to go. But Dennis writes here in March, the college football playoff and ESPN announced a six-year, $7.8 billion contract that runs through 2031 and 2032. And ESPN secured a six-year agreement that's going to cost $1.3 billion annually beginning in 2026 and 2027. That contract is built as either 11 or 13 games, all of which are going to be playoff games in a 12 or 14 team field. There are obviously going to be protections in place for the ACC and the Big 12 Conference champions, Notre Dame, um, the highest ranked group, the five team. Like None of that's going away immediately, but you're starting to chip away at it. Yeah, we'll give you a seat at the table at the end. That's one team that can come as we share all this huge revenue. But we're going to cut a game out in September that you are getting a payday on. And so it's they're just starting the process of kind of chipping away and getting where they want to get. The last line here in Dennis's piece says, sources hesitated to say any concrete decisions are going to be made next week, but Big Ten athletic directors have a regularly scheduled meeting on Wednesday in which they hope to prepare talking points and could produce real concrete things. So, look, and y'all understand, I'm not in that room. I don't have sources at Michigan or Ohio State. I'm just reacting to what national reporters are writing and, and, and what I can research and read and then giving kind of my angle on how things are going to work out. But to me, I don't expect a significant change very soon because all of this, all of this is about the television dollars. And they're not going to move forward with this alliance from a television perspective, the Big Ten is not, if the SEC doesn't get on board with those nine games. And the SEC is not going to get on board with those nine games unless the television contracts come to them and say, hey, we'll give you some more money. Well, what incentive do the television contracts who have the SEC on their airwaves right now have to rip that up and go pay the SEC more money? They they don't. It gets back into the legal world. The ACC's just drowning in the legal world right now because Florida State and Clemson are trying to leave and the ACC's trying to keep them there. And then you look out west and the pac is trying to destroy the Mountain West to keep itself relevant and the attorneys are doing all that as well and it all basically ends up in a courtroom which no one wants to hear about or learn about just give me the results what actually happens where are things going well I'll tell you where I think they're going I just don't have a good time frame for you and I think you're looking at closer to a decade than you are looking to the next three years because big big dominoes that include billions of dollars have to be moved around and their legal 
contracts in place to make sure they don't move right this second. Florida State can't leave the ACC right this second. It, it just can't. ABC is not running to the table in Charlotte or Birmingham, wherever the SEC network are having these discussions, wherever they broadcast from or where the headquarters are, I guess Birmingham, and saying, hey, here's how much money we can give you in addition to what we're already giving you. So because of that, I don't expect concrete things to happen very shortly. But you can tell the powers that be, slowly but surely, are moving to this. And this will look far closer to the AFC and the NFC and that playoff structure in the next 10 years than it did five years ago when we were having a a four-team playoff with five power conferences and no G5s. That's that's where this is going. And I don't think there's any doubt about that because the money is going to push it that way. I realize it's not the conversation everyone loves to have. We like to keep things between the line when you can, but this is a big, big story. And kind of like the top of the show where I was talking about Garrett Nussmeyer potentially going to the NFL because it's a bi-week topic. This is kind of a bi-week topic as well. On Wednesday, generally, I start to push closer to the matchup and start talking about some of the, the things that I want to see in the LSU game that Saturday. No game this Saturday, so talk a little bit about this. Either way, LSU's going to be fine. LSU's going to be swept up in all the cash, and they'll they'll come out on the other end of it. There are just maybe some, some folks in smaller conferences or the ACC or that are compromised here. I just, I'm not smart enough to know exactly where that shakes out, but it's coming. It's coming. No Pac-12, Big 12 doesn't have many chips to put on the table, and the ACC's dying. So the big boys, Big 10 and SEC, are coming, and they're going to figure this out one way or another. All right, that's it here for a segment on college football. We got uh, one more big segment here before we get to take it or leave it, and that, of course, is our SEC football powerings. I've got them right here. A lot of changes. A lot of changes this week in the power rankings. Did the top spot change? I, I'm not always beholden to results. If I think there's a team that is good, maybe didn't have their best day, I, I may leave them put. We'll see where things shake out coming up next. The Hunt Palmer Show. Boudreaux's Electrical Services. Neil and Melissa have been running things for four decades at Boudreaux's Electrical Services. They're a premier Generac dealer. They are a top 3% premier Generac generator dealer. Such a great process when you go through the process with the folks at Boudreaux's Electrical Services. You tell them what your concerns are. Here, how many square foot, square meter for feet I have. Here's what I need powered in the event of a storm. And when that happens, here's what needs to go on. And they'll go, okay, we got you. They'll customize that generator to your needs. They'll have it installed by a true professional. Most of the installation will be underground. And you'll have the peace of mind of knowing that when that storm comes through, you're going to still have power. And what they can do is they can monitor your generator remotely 24-7. So they'll know if there's some sort of mechanical failure. Not even in the event of a storm. Maybe it's just over the course of a normal day. Something happens mechanically or the kids are in the front yard throwing football or baseball around and somebody knocks something loose and you weren't even out there to know about it. Now you won't know that your generator is not ready to perform. But Boudreaux's Electrical will. They'll call you, hey, something's up. We're going to come check it. They'll get that fixed so that when the storm comes through, when the power failure happens, your power stays on. It's Boudreaux's Electrical Services. You can give them a call. Same number they had for 40 years, 985-397-1562. That's 985-397-1562. Or their new Gonzalez location, 225-300-9389. The easy way out, BoudreauxElectrical.com, BoudreauxElectrical.com. You're listening to The Hunt Palmer Show on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. Congratulations to Roy, Roy Bearmore from Baton Rouge and Jonathan Bryant from Metairie. Roy and Jonathan are the week five winners in our 2024 college football pick em contest and each wins a Hooters wing party for 10 people. Don't forget to make your picks for round six by tomorrow at noon. That is Thursday at noon weekly. Winners will receive a Hooters wing party for 10 people and the first place season long champion will receive a 75 inch 4K flat screen TV and sound bar plus Hooters wings for an entire year. It's a 2024 college ball pick up presented by Hooters. Top of the fourth inning in Houston at Minute Maid Park. Nothing, nothing between the Astros and the Tigers. Houston trying to keep their season alive. A lot of success by the road teams yesterday. Three of them uh, got wins until San Diego put it on Atlanta last night. Uh, but we'll see. Could be some teams punching their tickets to the next round. 
divisional round coming up today in Major League Baseball. All right, power rankings. It is that time, Beck. Let's roll. Hunt's SEC power rankings. All right, do we have a change at the top? The Texas Longhorns. We did. Georgia goes down in Tuscaloosa. I'll take Texas at the top. It was a sleepy first half against Mississippi State. I will grant you that. But look, they had their backup quarterback out there. He's played pretty well. And that Michigan win stands pretty tall. Michigan looks okay, and they did not look okay against Texas. I think Texas is really, really good. I will take them as the best team in the Southeastern Conference at number one. How about number two? The Alabama Crimson Tide. I debated this one, but Alabama's up three spots to number two hill here. Jalen Milrow is an absolute handful. He can run the ball as well as any quarterback in college football, and he's throwing it better as well. He's tough to deal with. They're they're good. They are a national championship threat. There's no question. The second half defense, certainly a concern in the game. They weren't great, but they've got a lot of talent. They've got a good coach. They've got a really good quarterback. So I've got Alabama at number two. The Georgia Bulldogs. Georgia at number three. They back up two spots from the top spot. They had a great second half. They've got elite talent. They've got elite poise in that environment to come back and almost win that game. They are far from done at this point. However, a little bit of concern because they usually don't give up that much with their defense, and they did. So um, you didn't play great against Kentucky. Lost the game against Alabama. Still very much a national championship contender, but I've got Georgia down at number three. The Tennessee Volunteers. Tennessee backs up a spot, but that's only because Alabama moved up three spots. Vols at number four, still, still very, very good. They've got at Arkansas this week, and then they've got a home game against Florida before Alabama comes to Knoxville, and we'll really see what the Vols are made of. I think they're very good. I don't think they'll have much trouble with either Arkansas or Florida, but I do have them at number four this week. That's where the Vols rest. The Ole Miss Rebels. Still got Ole Miss here at five. They back up one spot. People are going to go nuts over this. They didn't play anybody. Then they got beat. Yeah, that's that's true. They got whipped up front. They gave up four sacks, and they got beat at the point of attack. Um, They got the biggest game of Lane Kiffin's career coming up. I still think that Jackson Dart's very good. I still think that Lane Kiffin is good. Trey Harris is very good. They've got to run the ball a little bit better. And they've got some talent on defense. There's no question they have flaws. And so does everybody from five moving back. So I've got Ole Miss in the fifth spot. The LSU Tigers. LSU moves up a spot to number six. The defense looked a little better against South Alabama, looked a little bit better in the second half against UCLA. They're really good on offense. I think they can throw it against anybody, and you're probably all going nuts because Ole Miss shouldn't be ahead of LSU. Well, LSU's lost a game, too, and they had plenty of their issues in games against UCLA and Nichols as well. South Alabama doesn't cure everything. I still think LSU's pretty good, but I've got them a notch behind Ole Miss at number six. The Missouri Tigers. I backed Missouri up here. Um, They're running the ball pretty well. Nate Noel, second in the SEC in rushing, 639 yards per game, uh, 110 yards per game um, for him, uh, 6.39 yards per carry, 110 yards per game. They didn't do anything necessarily to deserve this. I still think LSU is playing a little bit better now at this point, but Missouri can prove me wrong by going to College Station and handling business. I backed up the Tigers one spot here to number seven. Texas A&M! Aggies at number eight. That's where they were last year. They are 13th out of a uh, out of a 16-team SEC in scoring offense. They are worst in the SEC in passing offense in terms of their completion percentage and yards per game. They've got to throw the ball a little bit better. Marcel Reed's taking care of it. Only four passing touchdowns, no interceptions. But he's not making a lot of big plays. They're eh, but... We'll see. Missouri and Texas A&M play this week. That's right there in the middle of the conference. Maybe something shakes out in College Station. The Oklahoma Sooners. OU goes to Auburn and wins, but I've still got them at number nine here. They are 15th in the league in passing offense. That doesn't change at Auburn. Their defense has been good. Second in the league in tackles for loss. They're tied for the best in the league in sacks. Brent Venables has got that defense rolling, but they don't have a quarterback. They don't have an identity on offense, and I backed them up to number nine. Um, That's where they stay this week. The Kentucky Wildcats. Kentucky moves up from 12 to number 10. That defensive line can play. They are good on the defensive front. They played great against Georgia, and they played great against Ole Miss. Those are two good offenses. Uh, They get after the quarterback. Brock Vandergriff Vandergriff played a little bit better in that game against Ole Miss. If he's better, Kentucky will be better. It's still not a work of art on offense, but that was impressive to go down there and get the points they needed late in that game to beat the Rebels. So Kentucky moves up from 12 to number 10 this week. Number 11. The South Carolina Gamecocks. Lenora Sellers comes back. Maybe the Kentucky win on the road was pretty good. Who knows? Um, They need to prove it this week. Ole Miss comes to town. 
If South Carolina plays great football this week, I could see them moving up. I know you think it's crazy that I would have Kentucky ahead of South Carolina. I I get it, but I can't do the head-to-head matchup on every single matchup. It doesn't work that way. Kentucky played better this past weekend. South Carolina is off. They got a chance against Ole Miss. They could jump Kentucky again uh, this week if, uh, if they play great football against the Rebels. We'll see. South Carolina at number 11. Number 12. The Arkansas Razorbacks. They back up a spot. They just find a way to lose. That's a bad thing about a program, but they do. They've, they've moved the ball pretty consistently, but they find a way to lose. They lost at Oklahoma State. They lost against A&M. They're fourth in the conference in total offense, and they got really nothing to show for it other than a win on the Plains at Auburn. It's just, it's just a program that can't quite figure it out, and I don't expect them to anytime soon. I got Arkansas at 12. The Vanderbilt Commodores. There you go, Beck. They stay there in a bye week. Didn't need to move them anywhere. They're the number 14 total offense in the SEC. That's not very good. But they're fourth in the SEC in red zone touchdowns. So when they get down there, they're getting some points. They're number 13 in total defense as well. So being 14th in offense and 13th in defense is not great. But they played better. So I got them there at number 13. The Florida Gators. Florida coming off a bye. They stay there at 14. In fact, the end of my rankings are all the same. Two-quarterback system was good uh, in uh, against Mississippi State. This is a must-win for Billy Napier once again because they play Central Florida this week. If they don't win that one, they may not win again. So you might want to get it. Uh, Florida at number 14 this week. The Auburn Tigers. Auburn's at number 15. They are 132nd in the country of 134 teams in turnover margin. They're 133rd of 134, almost dead last in giveaways. That's the story of the season, period. They can't take care of the football. It's cost them three games. And number 16. The Mississippi State Bulldogs. Good fight. Moral victory in the first half there in Austin for the Mississippi State Bulldogs. You get credit for that, but you're the worst team in the league, so that is... Mississippi State at number 16. Those are your SEC power rankings. Start at the top, Texas, Alabama, and Georgia, 1, 2, 3. Tennessee, Ole Miss, and LSU, 4, 5, 6. Missouri, A&M, and Oklahoma in the middle there at 7, 8, and 9. 10, 11, 12 is Kentucky, South Carolina, and Arkansas. Vanderbilt's at 13. Florida, 14. Auburn, 15. And Mississippi State Bulldogs come in at number 16. How do we feel back? I feel pretty good. I I am okay with Vandy's placement. I could maybe swap them with Arkansas there. Arkansas has um, not really won any games. I mean, they they, They went to Auburn. They they did, but they they had games that they easily could have won, and they just didn't. Counterpoint, Arkansas hasn't lost to Georgia State. That's true. But Vandy (laughs) also has probably the best win out of the two teams. Yeah, for New Tech. Um, How do you feel about the top three, Texas, then Alabama, then Georgia? I'm okay with it, I guess. Um, just I try not to get too caught up. I realize this is a ridiculous thing to say. It is. I try not to get too caught up in the actual win and loss and, and just this, the, the whole of how you played. Georgia was two feet away from winning. That yeah. fade route is two feet towards the sideline. Georgia guy goes up and makes a play. They win, and they're number one, and Alabama's number four. Yeah, but yeah, I, it wasn't. I, the, the guy picked the ball off. Yeah, I, I can I can understand that sentiment. Um, I would probably have Bama number one just because they have the best win in the SEC over Georgia. Uh, that's, be, that's definitely better than Michigan in the Big House. I think so, man. Michigan can't, literally cannot throw the they ball. They can't throw the ball. They can only run the ball. If if they go up against a competent team that can actually stop them running the ball, they're going to lose. I think they are well, definitely going to lose. Yeah, Texas did that, and there are going to be other teams that can do it as well. Uh, but I still think that that's the best win on on the the, uh, in the, in the, the one league. that gave me a little bit of pause, and this is the way that it goes: is I have Kentucky ahead of South Carolina. Yeah, that's a tough one, uh, obviously because the head to head. But Kentucky's got the obviously has a far the the best. They have the best win as well uh, uh, at, at Ole Miss, at and Ole they Miss. played Georgia to yeah. the nail exactly. And, like, and South Carolina has no. Am nothing. I giving South Carolina a lot of credit for blowing getting up, out, se- giving up, se- getting up seventeen nothing yeah. on LSU? No, I don't think so. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not opposed to that. Uh, yeah. You know, he, uh, the head to head is Simino tough. says but, terrible hunt. Yeah, not terrible. surprising. It happens every week. People <laughs> in the chat are kind, uh, kind of the point of the segment. Yeah, people in the chat are also calling you a Cowboys fan. You know, just just because you're from Shreveport. Oh well, that happens a lot. Richard yeah. Condon, our, our good friend who supports this show, just so so earnestly. Very, our number one supporter. He I really think. does love uh, the Hunt Palmer show. He supports it. Multiple times a day uh, on yep. Twitter, uh, loves loves what we do, loves the work here, um, and, and he, you know, he he, he has his concerns with my uh, Shreveport heritage and the fact that I, I may have pulled for the Cowboys once upon a time, and the fact that I, I don't necessarily pull for the Saints very hard. That that hurts Rich, 
And I apologize. I don't want to. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But that's just kind of the way. He, just how, yeah. That's how he, he handles things. So, thanks for your support, Rich. Right, we'll come back and close things out next. The Hunt Palmer Show. Make LaBear's Baton Rouge your game day headquarters this season. They got the biggest screens around, and now you can bet and dine at ESPN Bet in person. I talk to you about uh, ESPN Bet every single day here on the show. It's a great place to watch a game. One, they got great individual seating options. Two, they've got big tables. So if you've got a group you can watch, got a great wait staff that'll come get your drinks as well as your great food. And then if you're watching the game, maybe halftime pops up, there's a blackjack table like eight feet behind you. You can go play a little bit of cards, then get right back and watch uh, the game that you got some action on over the ESPN bet. It is a great place to go and check out uh, some games. So LSU's off this week. You want to go in all day Saturday and watch college football because you don't have to focus on LSU? Do it. The Saints don't play Sunday either. They're on Monday. You can go in, watch the Saints all day, watch uh, the NFL all day long on their awesome screens over there at ESPN Bet. LaBear's Baton Rouge, your live sports headquarters. Got to be 21 years or older. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-589-9966 for help. You're listening to the Hunt Palmer Show with former Texas A&M yell leader, Hunt Palmer. Giga Maggie's. percent uh, of our listenership has no idea what that's in reference to like 50%, i don't know I, I don't 60%. know I, that, that was a pretty viral moment in sports uh media last year or whatever year it was <laughs> i mean years ago I, I get people bring it up to me all the time so yes there's a sizable portion that certainly do remember it there've got to be a lot well and then i feel like a lot of people that listen do know that i hate AM. so even if they well i don't know about the yell leader thing they they know that that's I just ha- a well i i actually i do hope that a lot of people listen to this and actually think that you were <laughs> a, a yell leader. AM yell leader that would be even better honestly honorary yell yeah, leader of course i had uh, i'd been indoctrinated uh, just for that uh, just for that one day and then as i always have to mention as a caveat i did that we got a bajillion views everybody laughed said it was funny everybody texted me it was great and then our SEC West championship team with a eventual Heisman Trophy winning quarterback went to College Station and played an atrocious A&M team and got annihilated, yep. which is just embarrassing. Makes me very sad. It was very embarrassing. That game was miserable. What a disaster. Um, speaking of A&M, are they going to win on Saturday? Mm, no. You don't think so? I don't think so. In Kyle Field, you're, you're, you're trusting in Mizzou and Coach Drinkwitz? I, I, I believe in Coach Drink. I do. I think they're a good team. Is that because they beat Vanderbilt? Yes, I mean <laughs> Vanderbilt is a very good team, Hunt. That was a great win for them. I mean, they, a they, great there may win. Have, he there says. may have been like five missed field goals, but it was Look, a good win. College kickers. The Hashtag college kickers. That's what yeah. they say. All right, let's play some take it or leave it. All right, first one here. Diamond Sports Group, otherwise known as Valley Sports, are dropping all of their MLB contract except for the Atlanta Braves. They announced uh, in their bankruptcy hearings. Take it or leave it. I'm going to take it. I, I'll take it. I don't – I haven't had any experience with Valley Sports trying to find a Pelicans game and all that. We don't have to worry about that anymore, though. I know, the Pelicans, but thankfully. so many of, of y'all do, and my friends have. And it would just appear to me that, like, one of the more important aspects of carrying a team's games – would be human beings being able to watch said games. Yeah, that's usually like, important. That would feel like something you would take into account when becoming the broadcast partner of an organization. And based on what I've read and seen, Bally put that on the back burner yep. for about everybody. Like, yeah, well, we've got the game. You might be able to find it. Maybe not. You kind of will see. Like, people would, like, not know as of lunchtime if they were going to be able to see the game at 7 o'clock that night. It was just... How is that possible? Yeah, this appears to, to me, I've never negotiated a television rights deal for hundreds of millions of dollars, but that would probably be first on the agenda of things I'd like to talk about. If we make you the broadcast partner, can anyone watch it? And if that's not good, if that's not the case, then I might go away from that. Yeah, I think I would too. Uh, next one here, talked about it a little bit, but if today is Alex Bregman's final game in Houston, the Astros should retire his number, take it or leave it. I'm going to leave that. Yeah. Um, he's not a Hall of Fame player. He wasn't like the the catalyst of a, a world championship. I know that Springer was the MVP of their World Series. Correa was a big piece of that. Verlander was obviously a huge piece of that. And Bregman was certainly too. And there's no question he's kind of the last man standing as they've all moved on. And Alvarez has kind of become 
uh, the, the, the alpha in that lineup. He was a great selection for them at number two. He's been a wonderful player for their organization. He was part of a championship team and a, an unbelievable run of just getting to the American League Championship Series every year, which is absurd. Um, but I don't think that he's warranted a, a number retirement to this point. Yeah, I think he could, if he if he play if he had play c- continued to play there for maybe four or five more years, he maybe on a lesser team could be one of those guys that was just a lifelong player for the team and was really good for all those years. And maybe you do it, but the Astros have a great history. They've had a lot of good players that they retired. So I don't. I mean, think- Craig Biggio had three thousand hits. Yeah. Jeff Bagwell hit a bajillion home runs and won an MVP. Like, it's just. It's going to be hard. He doesn't, to, he doesn't reach that level. Yeah. Max one here. ESPN ranked the Saints number 15 in their NFL uh, power rankings this week. Take it or leave it. That's probably about right. I mean, I'll that's just it. kind of the deal. I mean, where would they have been last year? 15, 16, 18? Yeah. Like you're, that's about 500. If you're, if you're second on this list, you're a, a, a 14 and three team, a 13 and four team. If you're 26th on this list, you're a four and 13 team. The Saints are probably a ten and seven, nine and eight, eight and nine team, and that puts you in the middle. I just, just put, I don't know any, another way to say it. Everything about what the Saints are doing right now is middle of the league, and I hold out hope, and I think it's legitimate hope that they can get healthy and play closer to what they did in weeks one and week two than, than maybe they had the last couple of weeks. But McCoy's out two months, like that just is what it is, and Ruiz is banged up and. You know, the defense is aging, and Mario Davis and Tyron Matthew might get hurt. They're old. Uh, so it's um, – I have hope. I don't think that you, you you just cast complete cold water on this entire season at this point. And I, that wasn't my point in the uh, the segment we did earlier with Demo, uh, Devontae Adams. But I think that's a fair place to put them. Would it surprise me if the Saints finished up eighth on this list and made the playoffs? No. Would it surprise me if they ended up 26 on this list and didn't? Yeah, that would surprise me if they fell off a cliff. But I think they're a, they're a middle of the pack team. We got one more here. Malik Neighbors' uh, start to the season so far has been pretty quite in- good, incredible. except for you know getting hurt. Uh, except for getting hurt, but uh, he is there's uh, from PFF. There's a chart with uh, receiving yards per game and first downs per route run, and he is at the top right corner, which is very good. Uh, almost at the very top, the only person above him uh, is Odell Beckham, another former LSU Tiger, but elite neighbors, uh, rookie of the year candidate, offensive rookie of the year candidate. Take it or leave it? Got to take it. I mean, I'll right now he's, he's not the favorite because Jaden's been otherworldly. I wrote a story on LouisianaSports.net yesterday about the odds for, for Jaden just shrinking. You have to give money now to, to get him an offensive rookie of the year. But you can still get him at a pretty good price for, for MVP, 40 to 1. So, um, you know, Jaden throws some picks or it does, has some bumps in the road. I mean, I think Malik's going to be gonna be really good. What's working against Malik Neighbors is he doesn't have a quarterback. So yeah. he's, he's setting records with a bad quarterback thankfully, in place. Thankfully, after the first week, uh, Daniel Jones realized, hey, I'm just going to throw it to him yep, uh, 15 times that. a game, and it'll probably work out for the best. Call Jaden. It, it goes okay to yeah. make that happen. So, by the way, Brian Thomas Jr. also, also, also a really good well. start. So, LSU's. Uh, Got a pretty good brand working in, in in all sports, MLB, NFL, and eh, not so much in the NBA. But. I mean, there there's going to have to be a probably a, a discussion about whether or not LSU has their uh, title of DBU is transferred to wide receiver U at this point. If they keep playing defense like this, yeah, and they uh, keep putting receivers in the league that are you know receivers are quite good. Who's claiming that right now? I mean, I, I know we had uh, Ohio State probably, uh, but and and USC, USC. Had, had their their thoughts on it as well. LSU's got more high profile guys. USC's got a lot of guys. Uh, that are out there, but um, yeah, you know, I, I think LSU's pretty prominent wherever you're looking on the internet these days and on professional uh, on professional sporting fields and competition areas. That's it for a Wednesday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show. Fired up for tomorrow's show. We'll have Luke Johnson talking Saints as they get ready uh, to go to Kansas City. We'll also talk to Chris Blair. Um, no LSU game to get ready for, but uh, we will uh, we'll have plenty to, to chew on. We'll see what the Saints decide to do with Devontae Adams if something moves on that front here in the next 24 hours. We certainly talked about that uh, today. We talked about Garrett Nussmeyer on Mel Kuyper's big board of quarterbacks at number eight. Could it make sense for Garrett Nussmeyer to move on to the NFL? Kind of dove into all those possibilities at the top of the show. If you missed it, you can catch it on YouTube at Hunt on LSU. J.D. Piquel of 1-3 Sports with us talking the national college football scene at 115. It was a what-if Wednesday. J.V. and Toviano moving spots on LSU's defense. Brian Kelly talked about it on the teleconference this morning. We talked about it at 145. Are the Saints 
Truly in the mix for Devontae Adams. Can they make that work? All my thoughts at the top of hour number two. You can also find that at YouTube on Hunt on Saints. And our SEC Power Rankings. Fighting Tigers moved up a spot this week to number six. You can hear the rest of them uh, wherever you find your sound, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, uh, or on YouTube where our whole shows are archived each and every day. That's going to do it for us here on this Wednesday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show. Matt's going to drive you home next on After Further Review. He'll have plenty of thoughts on the Saints, Devontae Adams, LSU, and all things South Louisiana sports. Have a great Wednesday evening. We're back tomorrow, same time, same place, on Palmer Show.